cursed by the old gods of Bethany. We are five immortals doomed to walk the earth until we complete our thousand one tasks. After centuries of digging around, we are finally ready to complete our destiny and die. We are, for now, the immortals. And we have made it to episode 10. What? It's such Thank a great you. number. 10, 10, Thank 10. God. We are Violet. 1% done after this episode. Yeah. 10 is a that, really important really... number. Yeah. It's the basis of like our entire numeric system. Well, it's it literally cool. it literally is the base. It literally it. is the base. I mean, it's like really important. Yeah. Didn't the Babylonians or something use like 12? They use base said, 60, just go. like we do for minutes. Just stuff, how it's by minutes, yeah. 60 is a very highly composite number. Okay. So it has a lot of divisors. So you can cut it into halves, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, fifteenths, twelfths, whatever you want. That's a lot of numbers. Yeah. <laughs> they, I, I don't know how they have so many fingers and toes. I bet they borrowed friends. Must have. Had also, you hands. definitely can't cut 60 into 12s, can you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wait. <laughs> because it's divisible by 6. You're the one who starts and this by number two. Oh, 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 I am being dumb. Actually, wait, no, that doesn't... No, it, I'm not being dumb. Oh, my God. Doesn't it? 60 is 12 times 5. Yes, it is. You're correct. I'm dumb. <laughs> well, I'm tired. You're How many hedges do you get in mm. number 10, everyone? Number ten. ten? I give it ten hinges. Stop. Oh, wow. Please stop. Uh, <laughs> we have to figure out better ways to start the show. <laughs> I, give it, I give it ten in base two. I don't care. Do the math. Yeah. What's new today, Austin? No, we're going to start your names first. I'm Austin. I'm Adam. And I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. I'm Pedro. Cool. I'll consider starting there and cutting all this stuff beforehand. No, nope, yeah. we love it. Nope. Do it. But we are here. We are... A podcast called The Immortals, where every week we review one of the thousand and one movies, food, TV show, clap. Oh, nope, not more classic recordings, children's books, and oh. songs that uh, you must consume before you die. Uh, this week we are reviewing the 524th, um, one of those, yeah, things, <laughs> objects. We are doing those, and we're going to go around and say which ones we're going to be reviewing this week. The movie is going to be Clute. The album is Hearts and Bones by Paul Simon. The food is ostrich. The song is Cars. Uh, the children's book is 100 Million Franks by Paul Berna. And the TV show is Denzel and Pasco. And now that we've done got to episode 10, we thought, what's a fun way to do something new for every 10th episode? And we decided, you know, throughout the past nine episodes, we keep speculating what should or shouldn't be on these lists of these published books that we are referring to. And we decided every 10th episode, one of us is going to pick something that we think should be considered for that list. And we throw it into our official rankings. And we decided to let Adam go first. And Adam got to choose from any of the categories. Uh, movie, albums, food, songs, books, or TV shows. And Adam, what did you choose for us to review? I chose a food and I think my fellow immortals might be thinking that I'm, I chose this as a joke. But no. this, this, okay, good. Because this is one of my favorite foods. It's Arby's Curly Fries. Yeah, it is so good. They're so They're so good. good. Arby's, not a sponsor of their podcast, but they could be. Yeah. Could be. Wait, wait, hold on real quick. Are you guys eating Arby's Curly Fries? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we are. The frozen wait, really? ones. It's called Arby's Curly Fries in the back. Oh, all yeah. Right. Never mind. We got... I actually will make a plug. So Fancy. we are eating on air right now, obsessively, mm -hmm. um, the frozen ones out of the bag, which we have baked. I, this may be sacrilegious, actually like them better than the ones from Arby's for the following reason. They taste exactly the same, but they're baked instead of deep fried. They're mm. just as, they're greasy. They're plenty greasy. Like, they're not like, but they're not like too greasy. Mm -hmm. They're Damn good. Do they Jeez. come pre cooked? Uh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're cooked and frozen. So, like, you just you put them in for what, 20 minutes or something? Well, I'm wondering if they're already fried, which is why. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, they okay. definitely are. Yeah, they're all seasoned. They're all. They're, yeah, I agree with Sarah. These, these frozen ones are pretty damn good. It's really dangerous that I know that I can have these in my house, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> in my freezer all the time. Yeah, you did just change the game for me. I'm eating. Old, coldish curly fries we picked up a couple hours ago. I threw them in the oven for a little bit. Not a very hot oven, and not very long. But they're still good. 
So, Adam, why did you want? Why do you think this should be on the thousand and one foods you must consume before you die? Well, I wish I knew more about them, like how they're seasoned and and prepared and all that. But then again, I kind of don't because I like the mystique of mm-hmm. them. Um, but there's, I feel like this the sum is greater than its parts. Oh, for sure. And there's just, I don't know. Just whenever we pass by an Arby's, uh, at any point in my life since Arby's began, uh, they've just been so good. Yeah. Whenever you get a super curly, whenever I get a super curly one, I always wonder how they curl them. And then I imagine someone taking a pair of scissors and curling them like you would <laughs> a, like ribbon? a Christmas ribbon. Yeah. It would definitely not work, but would be awesome. It's like yeah. a bunch of people sitting so, around curling fries. <laughs> is this the greatest fast food thing to get? Um, yes. I would say a close second is Taco Bell's Cheesy Fiesta Potatoes, which are, yeah, they're like hash browns with sour cream and melty cheese on them. Right. But the the thing that Arby's beats about that is that you don't need any additives. You don't need any sauce, ketchup, anything. You can just eat these. That's true. You denied ketchup when I offered it before we started recording. No. I don't, they don't need ketchup. And you're right. They're impressed. Whereas I adore, you know, McDonald's fries, but... Ketchup is ideal for that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so there's... I have nothing more to say, except if you haven't had these, have them. So, (laughs) now... uh, For a hinge rating, do you need to separate them from what you get into the store as opposed to what we just got of their official frozen brand? No, I don't think so. The taste taste is comparable. Good. I don't think there needs to be a separate hinge rating. So... Because, I mean, I've... This is the first time I've had them frozen, and I always get them from the store. And I really, in a blind taste test, I probably would be wrong. And we're going to put the photo up on our Twitter account. It is shocking how much they look exactly like Harvey's fries. Mm-hmm. Well, no, guys, this is actually not that surprising. I, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble here, but they do not make Arby's curly fries in the Arby's. They <laughs> ship them to Arby's frozen. This is literally the exact same food. I thought they were job yeah. I thought they were going to have... The only difference is that we didn't, we didn't deep... We basically baked them instead of deep frying them, but they're the exact same thing. Great. All right. So, so that's a five for me. It's <laughs> a five? Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah? Oh, I can't give this a five. I mean, they're great, but, like, I mean, they're not the best food in the entire <laughs> oh, world. I can't it's, give it's, this a five. It's a four. <laughs> I'm going to give this a four. It's very tasty. Uh, 4.2. Lee? I can't eat them. Oh, no. <laughs> Aww. Lee. I have a stupid gluten intolerance. Are they glutened, even though they're potatoes? Yeah, because oh, the sense. seasoning and the breading and such. Yeah, that makes awesome sense. Awesome for me, because I'm eating all of these. <laughs> he is, and I'm oh. very jealous right now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I do have- I have fond memories of them, and they are so good. Are you sure you don't want a tiny little piece? Sure. Look at how small they are. Uh, Do you but, want to review the memory? Uh, well, no, because it's hard to review something through nostalgia goggles. Smell them. <laughs> <laughs> You're being awful, Pedro. <laughs> that's kind of creepy. Okay, that's. Yeah, I do miss them. I will say that. Right. You should still review your memory. <laughs> we'll put an asterisk next to it. Um, I'll give them a four. They were a solid four. So, uh, once we get our website up, which I'm still working on every week, uh, you can see all the different ratings, we average ratings for all that we have for all of our hinge ratings. And this is now, this will now be among the food list. And we'll see if it's better than some of the awful food that we've had. So, oh, God. <laughs> so, we know for a fact it will not be last, which means it's worthy of being in the book. But now let's go on to our, our official review. Not this wasn't official. But the, the movie we're reviewing this week is the 1971 thriller Clute. This is uh, an Oscar, Oscar-winning film starring Jane Fonda and Don Sutherland. It is a mystery story where they need to find a missing person, John Clute, the detective. And his only real lead is a prostitute named Bree Daniel. And they start quite the interesting relationship in order to get all the information they need to solve this case. This is my uh, second time watching this movie, a phrase I keep saying on the podcast. Um, but who, who's, who was the first time seeing this movie? It was my first time seeing it. My first time. My first time. And my first time. All right. Now we take a drink. <laughs> Bam. He's doing it. He's taking a drink right He's now. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm dedicated. You said Oscar winner. What did it win? Best Actress. 
That ah, makes sense. That does make sense. Is that why you watched it? Yeah. And I heard it was good. Oh, okay. Good. Well, you heard correct, because this was good. So what do you think, Pedro? I liked it a lot. I was, uh, well, so, spoiler alert, Jack Bauer's dad is <laughs> is the guy. Is Donald He's cute. Trump's I already yes. said it's in the movie. Yeah, I know. When I was, like, halfway through. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so I was reading about the movie. I was like, wait, Sutherland? No way. <laughs> um, <laughs> they do. They Like, the profile shots, I would keep pausing and, like, looking at him. And he would so morph it, it, back and forth from Jack Bauer to Like, at Luke. what point in the movie were you like, hey, maybe this is... No, at no point. I was just looking up the movie oh, and I okay. found out that it was him. But, no, I really liked this movie. Um, I really liked the... The way they put spookiness into it, even though not a lot of times anything actually spooky happened, it yes. reminded me. It reminded yeah. me of Jaws, and I'm saying this not just because of this other thing. A Jaws actor is in this, which blew my mind and made me really happy. But um, like, yeah, you don't need to see that's where that guy's from. The okay. evil or scariness to be afraid. I don't know. It was it was great to follow. Even though it wasn't like super action packed or anything, and it was still called a thriller, I would definitely call it a thriller myself. Um, Clute is awesome. The person, uh, yes, yes, the person, Clute, and 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 the actor, Jack Bauer's dad, is also really awesome. Donald Sutherland. He's Jack a more Bauer's accomplished dad. actor than Cooper Sutherland. Yeah, he's been he's, in so many yeah, things. <laughs> I, I I know this, but he's he's still Jack Bauer's dad. Okay. Um, Jane Fonda, holy shit! She was awesome. She was. Amazing. She was Really great. She's so good. While, I'm sitting. I'm like, who is this? I like you. Oh, you're Jane Fonda. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was a great movie, and I was sad that I hadn't seen it before. It's. I like also the time that it's from. Like those weird, what early '70s mm-hmm. movies were like. It, it just feels so gritty, and real. I don't know. I always get a weird feeling watching them, and usually it's not a good thing. But in this movie, it was amazing and. What's the, that's the fun of the late 60s, early 70s films, because basically the old Hollywood had died, and this is now the new Hollywood. The production mm. code was gone, so now studios are making these edgier and still small-budget films. People can really experiment yeah. with pacing, lighting, uh, acting shifted like crazy during mm-hmm. the past uh, 10, 20, 30 years in this time. It was, a, it was a very dark movie. Oh, yeah. When you said lighting, like, I had trouble yeah. seeing it on my monitor a lot of times. Was, was that the movie itself? Or is that I heard something? that was your monitor, but no, there were, it no, was yeah. pretty movie. Well, I had two monitors. One was a lot brighter. But I was wondering if, like, if this is something that, you know, sitting there in theaters back in the day would be mm. more visible. I watched it on a few screens, and that was my experience with it as well, um, was that it was... So, I well, I did not like the movie as much, and the reasons uh. were because of some of the things, the, the, <laughs> the changes that Austin mentioned. I felt a little bit like it was an experiment in a couple of um, tropes or ideas uh, that would later be done very well in other movies, but that did, didn't work so well in this one. My two big complaints were the lighting, uh, which I did find dark to the point of like it was like they were trying to make an atmosphere and it felt mm. very forced to me and the soundtrack which drove me crazy for the first I half of the movie this. no because because it wasn't well balanced with voices and it was very much and it was like they felt the need to put music behind conversations that didn't need them which really bugged me and these are the kinds of nitpicking things that rarely get to me but for some reason for this movie I think it w- it was something that got me thinking about a lot of the other things, and I also found Clute kind of. I mean, it's hard to say he's tropey because I think he was probably fairly original as a character at the time that he was, but I do find him tropey, and I mean, he's got elements to him that remind me of the sort of autistic aspergery detective that we all know and love on so many screens now. Um, and I just... So, all that being said, though, uh, Jane Fonda's performance, for me, this was one of those movies where I'm like, oh, of course, this one Best, best Actress. Because she is unbelievable. She's... The, the, we were, Austin and I were talking about what the movie should be called, and, like, mm-hmm. Clute isn't really the star of the movie at all. Uh, it's, it's really Jane Fonda, and she is completely captivating every time she's on screen. It was just the technical elements and the pacing and it didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't, it didn't gel for me. It just didn't. 
I wonder if by naming it Clute, they were kind of trying to create uh, a mystique or like a superhero, I guess. Is That's that what it felt like that? to me. I'm, like, I'm shocked there were no sequels to this. this yeah. It feels like a very... Yeah. Like, like they were starting to, trying to start a franchise. Sure, because it's not mm-hmm. based off a book or anything. So yeah. It's an original... That movie. was surprising to me. I assumed... Because it, it felt like a... Yeah, you it know, does, kind of. Like a, like, yeah. a, like a novel. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I agree. When Clute gets on the, gets on the screen, you're like, Oh, Clute! This movie is about you! Um, and it really isn't. No. Nope. Yes. Yeah. And I thought he was... Also, kind of, just kind of dull. As a no, you are wrong. <laughs> no, well, I, I agree with you there, Adam. I, I think Clute by himself is a pretty kind of flat character, but Donald Sutherland does some really weird things with him. Mm-hmm. Just, like I think he's not written as Asperger's as Sutherland's performing him. Mm-hmm. I think he's. Just I think of, it's fair. He's written as very kind of traditional detective, mm-hmm. private eye, has a bit of a past, um, a little gruffy, but Sutherland is so freaking still. And so many, <laughs> yeah, he is. And so many yeah. scenes, which is amazing because in a movie called Clute, he's John Clute. He basically lets Jane Fonda control every scene. I was and pretty, that's a very generous acting move, I think. I was pretty sure that he was going to kill someone. Like, as in, like, was a serial killer for part of the movie. Even though it made no sense with the plot at all, I was like, he just has that serial killer vibe to him. I thought that at first before I realized he was actually Clute. <laughs> it's like, who is this guy? Are you gonna do something bad? Oh, you're the main character. Okay. Because like, I have a really good friend who has that that creepy stillness about him, and we often tell him that it's concerning because it makes him seem like a serial killer. Like, <laughs> people should move more than Donald Sutherland does in this movie. Yeah, the only other characters you really see on screen who are that still are serial killers, like exactly. uh, Gus in Breaking Bad. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, the interesting thing about that, though, is that if you, like, the very first scene at the dinner party, mm-hmm. I, I really paid attention to Donald, what Donald Sutherland was doing, and he was, like, happy and talking quite a bit, it seemed like, um, yeah. to people, and just being, like, generally jovial, but as soon as he starts this, uh, being a private detective, it's like, that is wiped away completely. For sure. So, well, you know, there's, there's Clute on the job, and then Clute after the hours. Yeah. And I think if you consider that, that's interesting. But that was that was the only evidence of that. That's sort of what I got from it, that his very still lack of emotion or movement and all that, that was just his professionalism. And he let the girl, you know, do whatever in the scenes because he's like, okay, I just have to make sure I watch over you and you don't run away. I'm eyes on the prize always. Mm. That's what I thought. I don't know. Something well, no, I do know. That is what I thought. <laughs> so it's my second time watching it, and I, it was weird to have the same reaction years later in that it begins, I'm into it, I love the subtlety of the creepiness of the scenes, I love what's going on, here's this mystery, and then you get to the character of Bree, and she starts to be part of the plot, but then they give her so many scenes removed from the mystery story, yeah. where you see her <laughs> life, you see her therapy scenes, you see her auditions, uh, you see her being a prostitute, you see her trying not to be a prostitute, and both times I watch this film, I completely then forget what the mystery is about because it becomes, oh yeah, it becomes I have no ma- idea what the mystery is. Yeah, I couldn't like tell you the full to find mystery someone. story. Okay. Well, and so I, it's a, it's a compelling mystery for about ten minutes, and then it's an amazing character study for about an hour and a half, mm-hmm. and then they go, oh yeah. By the me. way, this is a private detective movie. <laughs> And it's a really dramatic and compelling ending, but I forgot all the reasons why we're there, but I still like the film because that essential, the real meat of the film, is his character study. This is an incredible character. Um, mm-hmm. Very well realized, and I mean, there's so many now like prostitute cliches in films, just as mm-hmm. much as private detectives. I think Jane Fonda and the writers of this kind of really gave a specificity to the character of Brie that made her very unique absolutely yeah well like where sarah was saying that clute feels very stereotypical even though because of all the tropes that we see now brie never felt stereotypical to me she felt like a new character that i Mm -hmm. hadn't seen or hadn't hadn't met before and i really appreciated that a lot yeah i found particularly interesting there's this i loved her therapy scenes i thought they were Mm. all really cool so cool Mm -hmm. because it's just she's None of the... She's got a ton of self-awareness. She seems to know exactly 
who she is, and yet at the same time is clearly desperate for someone to help her, which is a really fascinating combination that really resonated for me um, as sort of just, I mean, as, you know, like the way that you, that it, it is, as a way that it is possible to be that you don't always see in film. Like, knowing that you're doing something that maybe is destructive, knowing why exactly you're doing it, kind of wanting to stop doing it, but not being sure that you do, and just needing to talk to somebody about that. But, you know, like, as opposed to, like, have, she's, I don't feel that there's a lot about the character that we know and the character herself doesn't know, and I find that really compelling. Mm-hmm. And what's still a lot of ambiguity, there are things about the end of the film which I think is very wonderfully vague about what her future entails. And I was very worried, especially kind of rewatching the film, I mean, some years apart, of, okay, this is a movie directed by a man and written by two men. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see how they handle this prostitute story. And I was amazed on how I don't think it was ever like they never sexualized the character without her permission. Yeah, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, I yeah. agree with that. I, I felt more comfortable with the prostitute in this movie than the prostitute in Taxi Driver. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, I think I think they have different. Well, different no, ways of like. Portraying. I I understand that, like, the one in Taxi Driver, it's supposed to be an uncomfortable situation, but it never felt, I don't know, organic or, like, original. It felt like a cliche that was forced into this movie. I think... Whereas uh, this movie, it just makes sense. I think Jane Fonda said it herself, is that she always felt like she had control, and in Taxi Driver, Jodie Foster seemed kind of thrown into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Taxi Driver, which is a film that came out, I believe, four years after this, that is a world that is so incredibly gross. It is yeah. a gross, gross movie. Your main character is very much a sociopath. Um, Don't just, spoil it. I, no, <laughs> well, he is a sociopath. Okay, good. That, that's, that's pretty early on in the movie you catch on. I mean, it's not subtle in that way. It's just a kind of very different world, I guess, in the in the spectrum of prostitutes on film, <laughs> uh, Brie is between Pretty Woman and Tax Driver. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank I you. suppose. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with it. <laughs> I, I need to watch Taxi Driver first. <laughs> it, it was on Netflix at one point. I don't know if it still is. I don't think so. So... Thank you. Yes. <laughs> shall, shall we hand? No, um... What, what? Wait, one more one more thing I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. Just getting on Jane Fonda and stuff. Very quick. She could have won the Oscar just for her tapes alone. Like, listening to her. Oh, yeah. I was like, this person is amazing. Oh, yeah. Just her simple... It was, it was, it was ridiculous. That's it. That, <laughs> it's an incredible scene. I, I'm blanking right now. I believe Jane Fonda won two Oscars, and this is one of them. Could be entirely wrong. But she's had just an incredible career, and this is one of highlights. Mm-hmm. This director went on to make some really good films like All the President's Men and Sylvie's oh, Choice. Yeah. And um, he's just not a name people really remember. I do not recognize What's his name? Alan J. Bakula. I definitely have never heard of him. Yeah, me neither. And those are all I mean, those, those are all great movies, yeah. Established American films. And yet, uh, I think it's a lot of credit. There's so much really kind of clever things that are going on with the movie you kind of don't know where things are going. There's so many... He lets the camera linger for so long where you can see so many acting choices in the background. Like, I, I really love... I believe the first scene with Brie when she's at a casting call and it's a big, wide shot and you watch the guy who's evaluating the actresses kind of walk down and, like, look at some of them, have some of them stand up and whatnot. And he looks at her, but then he continues down the row of chairs and you get to just watch her face while the casting director is facing the other way. Mm. So the back is to her, and you kind of see her still in the room, still professional, but really struggling with the fact that she knows she was just overlooked for probably the 20th time this week. And they were saying some really blunt things about yes. her yes. and everyone else in that room. So that was a good indication of the kind of world that she lives in. I think. Oh, for sure. And the kind of stuff that she has to deal with. Yeah, it's such a way to make, like... There, there are a number of films prostitutes of the main characters, and sometimes it's kind of hard to 
sympathy is a weird thing about these kind of stories because there are sometimes films that judge too harshly, sometimes they you know, exploit them. This was kind of a very great way to see what her life is like, and you you understand why she makes choices that even she disagrees with. Mm-hmm. It's a good film. I, I recommend it to everyone. Really, let's, let's do some hinges. I'm going to give it four hinges. I like this quite a bit. Yeah, me too. Four. No, four point two. This is this is as good as Curly Fries to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. 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 That's the top winner. That's the poster <laughs> quote right there. <laughs> As good as curly fries. Oh yeah. Um, I'll give it a three point five. Um, Jane Fonda really saved it for me, but I guess that's why you watch it anyway. So yeah, three point five. I'm gonna give it a two point eight. Whoa! Uh, I can't ever see myself watching it again. Jane Fonda's great, but there are lots of movies with one standout performance, and uh, I don't. I just I, it wasn't complete to me. It didn't work for me. Lee, what'd you think? Yeah, I'd give it three. I'd be much happier if this were just a character study of Jane Fonda's character the entire time. Get rid of the mystery. Just have an hour and a half long character study. It almost is. Yeah. But, it, it, <laughs> but it's not. Yeah, no, it is. With some extra bits in the beginning and the end. Yeah, just, that, and those, in. those parts aren't good. That's spice. It's, <laughs> and to me, that's what holds back from like a 4.5. Is that like, oh, this could have been a really great film, but I might it's a really good film. I think it's mm. worth checking out. We have a variety of opinions. This is on DVD, and it plays on TCM all the time. Hmm. So, Clute. check it out. It also, it does have a really satisfying name to say. Clute. Clute, Clute, Clute. Clute, 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 Clute. It's a very silly name. It's the use sound. Now, Lee, we have now an album that is pretty uh, popular. It, it seems like a critically liked album. Yeah. It's by one of the greatest musicians alive, so, I mean, yeah. pretty cool. Um, what are we what are we reviewing this week, Lee? We're reviewing Hearts and Bones by Paul Simon. Oh, he's great. I love Paul Simon. Don't get me wrong. I was very excited when this number came up, and I was like, ooh, a Paul Simon album. I'm not familiar with this one. I'm excited. No. It, <laughs> it's not good. Whoa. No? Don't break the lead now. Ready um, for hunches? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Like, we were discussing this off air, like... <sighs> Just some of the songs on this album, like, there are a couple (laughs) theories behind some of these songs. I am a firm believer that he just really needed an album and Deadline was coming up, so he was like, you know what, um, let's sing about allergies. I have allergies, let's sing about allergies. Cars? Car, uh, cars. Let's, let's sing about that for three and a half minutes. Engine in the front, trunk in the back. (laughs) (laughs) It's, oh. No, Jack in the back. Oh yeah, it was Jack in the back. So, there are ten songs in this album. You've named yeah. now uh, number one and number nine. What, what about the, the rest of them? Is, is Paul Simon, are there any good ones in this album? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. So, I listened to this album probably four or five times, and nothing ever stood out except the ridiculously bad ones. Like... Allergies is not a good song. Cars Are Cars is not a good song. <laughs> Cars Are Cars is a hilarious song and the only one that I listened to because when you told me about it, it cracked me the hell up and I it's, did listen to it and it's really bad. It's so bad. <laughs> it's really shockingly bad. Like, and then Think Too Much, A and B. That's what throws me off, that there's an A and a B and they're in backwards order and they're the same song. Yeah, but different And separated music. By yeah. And then there's the song called Song About the Moon. Guess what that one's about? Cars? It's not about the moon. <laughs> like, it's just, it's not good. And I was very, very sad because I do love Paul Simon and I do appreciate a lot of his solo work. Do you? I, I do. Do you? I did. That's better. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, this one is just bad. So it seems like this album is remembered the most because of three songs. The title song, Hearts of Bones, is apparently about his relationship with Carrie Fisher, the actress. Oh! Yeah. And I thought that was fine. She's song. crazy. Yeah. Wow. She I don't know if, is... I mean, she's like my favorite. She's like my spirit animal now. Yes. I don't know if she like was, oh, if she was like yes. man. No. She is my feminist spirit guy. She is consistent. Don't okay. worry. Um, so I mean, that song is where the title comes from, and um, Renee and Georgette Magritte with their dog after the war. Um, 
seems to be the most beloved critically song of the album, talking about the artist. But those, those were my two favorite songs. Yeah, I like those two quite yeah. a bit. The only other one I had heard before was the late, great Johnny Ace. I've actually heard that one before, and it was okay. And Renee and George Magritte, it was okay, too. But, like, nothing nothing ever made me stop and want to listen to it and, like, stop whatever else I was doing and just focus on that. It was all just, like, background noise. No, you can't. You can't focus on this. I listened to bits and pieces. But it's mostly the songs that Lee hated and then the ones that she said weren't terrible. And very bland and boring and meh. Perfect background music. I thought, I mean, when I started listening to it, I, I did not hate this as much as you did, Lee, but... Um, <laughs> I you know. don't hate it. Well, okay, I do kind of. I was just really <laughs> disappointed because one of my favorite albums of all time is the concert in Central Park with Simon and Garfunkel. It's basically a greatest hits album, but it's so good and so well done to turn around and listen to this is just really disappointing. Yeah, but he's missing a Garfunkel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's apples and oranges. True. Did you yeah. look up did you look up the history with this album because it's yeah. they, it was originally going to be uh, well if you did I'll let you say it. <laughs> oh, I don't know what you were going to say. I just know that oh. it was like it's his fifth solo album and it's numerous years after Simon and Garfunkel. Was it? Yeah. Cuz I saw on the the Wikipedia page which you know is whoever writes yeah. that. But it says that it was originally supposed to be a Simon and Garfunkel album. Oh, wow. But then he, um, they got into a tiff, a tiff, and he spent, <laughs> it said he spent a month digitally taking out every note that Garfunkel uh, did. And uh, so, so I wonder if it suffered dark, man. due to that. Oh, no, I totally believe that it suffers because of that. Like, it, you can tell, like, there's just something missing from everything. Like, Simon and Garfunkel have a song that's parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Just repeated basically over and over again. It's a fantastic song, even though it's super simple. Pretty much everything that Simon and Garfunkel did. I mean, there's like just very few songs that they did that are anything other than pure gold. I mean, it's just an amazing duo. Yeah. I think even though a lot of the songs fell flat to me, there was still that Paul Simon sound to it that I still enjoyed listening to, even though none of those songs really stuck with me. The one time I really did take note, I knew this going in this was going to be somewhere in the album, didn't know where, but I was like, oh my god, this sounds incredible. And this was the one minute that Philip lasted. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, yep, that was at the end of the late great 20s. Oh, okay, so I'm looking up the Wikipedia pages as well. So Concert in Central Park came out in 81, and then they did a world tour in 82, 83, and this came out in 83. So probably, yeah, I could believe it was going to be a Simon and Garfunkel album, but then they got into another fight and decided to break up again. So and actually, yeah. because I'm terrible at focusing on things, I'm reading the original Rolling Stone review of the of the album, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And it does it was it was meant to be a reunion album. Yeah, um, but that was, makes sense. Yeah, because like concert in Central Park was so successful right. as an actual concert, and then as you know everything afterwards, the album and then the video. It was so successful. So I can see why they would want to try to rekindle some of that magic. And they definitely needed something on this album. Uh, yeah, it's a strange one. Um, Pedro, do you have any more thoughts? No. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't give me enough to... No. No. All right. Lee, let's hear your hinge. One. One. <laughs> it's like you pre-saw that. No, like, it was, it was just so bad. It was... Like and I can't even pretend to like it. Like and I I do love Paul Simon and I love Simon and Garfunkel and I'm oh I always thumbs them up when they're on my Pandora stations, but this is just it's not good. Wow. Uh Pedro, how about you? Uh the bits that I listened to it two point two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna give it a two. I'm gonna give it the highest rating apparently of a two point eight. <laughs> wow. Even though only a few songs kind of stuck with me, the the Paul Simon sound still made this actually a very quick listen and very pleasant sound. And uh, Sarah, what do you give that one song's rating? Fives. Fives. Four cars out of Fives. five. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I feel like that song would do really well as like a kid's song. Like if they played it on like Nickelodeon or whatever kids. Oh, that makes a lot of sense, right? You have to get lower than that. It's Barney level. 
Okay, if mm-hmm. they played it on Barney, I'm sure it would be super successful. True. <laughs> Mm. Well, Barney is a weird-looking animal. Yeah. Now let's go to the ostrich. You know what? Uh, it's so actually cool. it's actually kind of a song that you might sing to make fun of a Paul Simon song. Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense, Ray. You know, yeah. It's like a it's like an act of self parody. Like, yeah. But I don't think he was that clever. Uh, <laughs> no. I probably agree with you. That's a perfect transition. But, but yeah, let's go back to that transition because <laughs> Barney I like... about Barney. Yeah. Barney. Yeah, and he's a dinosaur from our Barney's imagination. A stupid little animal. Whatever. Fine. We're at the food section now. Ostrich! Thank God. Ostrich. I'm so hungry. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> apparently. All of that Jesus. Uh, oh. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, so, yeah, yeah, ostrich is today. Um, so, uh, it sounds like Pedro and Lee have it with them and have cooked it themselves. Yeah. Ostrich, ostrich and I. Found it. Yeah, that's awesome. We, uh, Austin and I, uh, struck out a little bit because the meat market we were going to go to, uh, was closed for the holidays, but we had a absolutely awesome ostrich burger, uh, the other day at a restaurant that I really like that serves a lot of weird meat called Frontier here in Chicago. Uh, they had an ostrich Juicy Lucy, which is, Juicy Lucy is when you take hamburger and in the middle of it, you put cheese, but when you cut it, oh. there's just, like, cheese everywhere, but you, like, Sounds crimped good. the sides, and it had caramelized leeks on it. It was real good. Um, but, uh, yeah, Pedro and Lee, are, are you going to, like, dig in? I think you should. Oh, uh, I'm already eating yeah, my Oh, you're, you're already eating. Okay. Yeah, we've got... Okay, so uh, we went to... Shout out Joe's Butcher Shop, downtown Carmel, Indiana. Hi. Um, bought some ground ostrich. Uh, not the cheapest thing in the world, but that's okay. Really good. I yeah. like it. It's, uh, I made it very simply. Whoops. That is some, that is me cutting my ostrich. Apparently it's still alive. Um, all I did was... None of those noises make any sense. <laughs> salt, pepper, chopped garlic. garlic, or not chopped, diced, minced, whatever, garlic, onion, um, anything else? Did you make MSG. it into? Did you make I put it in into, MSG. Uh, well, that, that's why it tastes good. No, but uh, did you uh, did you make it into burgers? Yes, we, we made, made them into, into, into little patties and yep on, a, on a pan, and we're eating them, and they're really good. Yeah, so we I eat, the the best way that I can describe it and review is that it is really like exactly halfway between a turkey burger and a beef burger. It is like the it is it has less fat than beef burger by far. Mm-hmm. Um, but it tastes like, so that's more like a turkey burger, but it tastes a lot like a beef burger. Yeah. Um, it does. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my ostrich burger was phenomenal, uh, but it was primarily phenomenal, I think, because it was also just like a damn good burger at a damn good restaurant. Mm-hmm. My feeling about the ostrich meat was that it is relatively expensive. Um, it's, in fact, quite expensive. I feel, it, does anyone else remember when ostrich was like, Ostr- eating ostrich was like a thing. I feel yeah. like it was like a part of it was like yes. it was like a health food craze. Like, don't want to eat red meat, eat what's, ostrich instead. It's red business? though. No, like it's in, like, redder than beef. Yeah, but in like the early yeah. like early twenty first century, like mm-hmm. like you know like two thousands and late nineties. Yeah. I just like remember reading a lot about this. I think because I really like emus. They're one of my favorite animals. And they're a lot like ostriches, and so I wait to being, eat or like no alive. Like, like alive. Okay. And so I was really horrified at the <laughs> idea of eating ostrich as a child, but I've gotten over this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, so, I, I I agree. Oh, sorry, Ashton, go. I'm eating. <laughs> Couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I had a few bites. Um, I had a few bites removed where it was just the the patty without any thing else on it, which I did as well. Burger. And then I took a bite of the burger itself, and it was incredible. But I found that, like, I don't know if I could pass a taste test of this being just like, here's a burger. Um, I do, like, the more I thought about it and the more I took a couple more bites, it was um, like a, a lighter meat. Anyway, I don't know if that makes any sense. It didn't feel as, as juicy or heavy, mm-hmm. but it was still very, very tasty. And that burger in particular was really incredible. Mm-hmm. This restaurant okay. called The Frontier basically is like uh, Ron Swanson's Haven. It's a wonderful place. Everyone's mm-hmm. wearing plaid. It is the most like manly. Like a stuffed thing in the world. bear. There's like not like a not like a teddy bear, like a, like a yeah. taxidermy bear. Crazy meat <laughs> everywhere. Um, it's a really good place. So I, I liked it. I, I did not expect 
my ignorance really was expecting there to taste like feathers. I, I, just, uh, I just couldn't imagine why, the meat without... Why? Because ostriches you know that look... Ch- you know, chickens have feathers, too. I know, but I've never seen ostrich meat before, and I just kept <laughs> picturing, like, still a little bit of feathers around. Is that how you pictured chicken meat? I think it might have been a cartoon in my mind as well. I really mm. don't know. Okay, honey. Um, I, yeah, I don't... I think I would pass a blind taste test just because it's it's different enough. I might be like, well, what is this? It's either some really weird kind of beef or it's the bird. But it does taste a lot like beef burger. I don't know what turkey burgers taste like, so I can't really it has corroborate. A, it has Sarah's. a little bit of a different aftertaste. It than does. Beef. I yeah. think it doesn't. It doesn't have like Austin said. It's a bit lighter. It definitely has more flavor in some aspects but not others like it's not as it's not as deep flavored as beef yeah but there's a lot of like middle flavor that sits like mm-hmm. right on your tongue or on your palate it'd be a perfect burger i that, really do think like yeah. it needs a little bit of swiss or something on yeah. it i think it'd be i really think good i think that. it tastes like hamburger done right like we, if, I I agree, were, yeah. if i would expect a hamburger to taste like something this is what it would be striving for also. i actually kind of agree I, which is which is weird because mm-hmm. i it does. I don't get the feeling that it requires much uh, work or preparation to make it like that. Yeah. Whereas, actually, making a really, really good hamburger is relatively difficult. Yeah. In, in a weird way, you have to pick the right like combination of meats. I guess my only problem with it, to be honest, is price. I mean, in comparison, I agree with Austin that I think it would be. Although I think it's a delicious burger, mm-hmm. I think I would be hard pressed to. To you know, one hundred percent of the time, tell the difference between an ostrich yeah. burger and a beef burger. An ostrich is expensive. <laughs> How yeah. much, what was your price? So the burger this? was actually reasonably priced, but this is a place that sort of specializes in making fancy, weird meat reasonably gotcha. priced, so I, I don't really go by that. But when I went to try and buy it, I mean, it would have been like a solid like $20, $25 uh, for, to get a pound. Like, a pound. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's what I paid. Which that's is a the, lot. That's it was a 20, lot. 21 something. I figure if I'm going to pay that, I may as well get like I mean, that's like four, that's like Four, that's, a, that's like yeah exactly that's like four times the price of ground beef so uh, mm. that's a lot <laughs> no it's good though I can't stop eating it is no it's, it's real good I think we're ready for hinges because uh, Adam did not join us at the restaurant because uh, I forgot to invite him <laughs> <laughs> also um, uh, he doesn't eat meat yeah so the macaroni and cheese at Frontier though is very good as well if you're oh, going there it is really good that. yes okay. super tasty oh get it with ground ostrich next time <laughs> whatever it is that we had in mind you look at me like what could he eat from this yeah <laughs> not a lot nothing here just the mac and cheese just the mac and no cheese. bacon yep <laughs> so Sarah uh oh, this is hard I'm gonna give it a 3.5 wow. that's it yeah, well, because it's just, it's four times as expensive as ground beef, and it tastes yeah. Yeah, I guess the same. Right. But, we, but I mean, like, if you're reviewing you truffles, you can't yeah, be like... No, 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 but like, if I'm judging, if, if beef is on the list, and ostrich is on the list, I would also give beef about a 3.5. I like okay. beef, I don't think beef is the best food in the entire world, and they taste the same. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go just on the, the taste experience, I'm going to go 4.5. All right. That was... Oh, uh, agreed. <laughs> all, right, all right, Pedro. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pedro, what, what is your hand rating? Uh, 4.5. All right. I'm going <laughs> to give it a solid 4. It's really good, and I wish I could afford it one day when I am a millionaire. Again, oh, yeah. like, I'll, I'll get my own ostrich farm and have ostrich well, burgers. someone hits the Powerball, it's at, like, 1.5 billion now. Yeah. I'd probably just eat this. Well, well no, I'd eat other things, too. My quality will go up. Yup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would eat just this in Troubles. <laughs> and that would just, be the end of Pedro. Just that. We all thought he would die from completing this curse of all these challenges. Nope. Turns out the loophole was just ostrichs and truffles. Yep. That makes well, a lot of sense to me. Yep. All right, Pedro, it's your turn now. This is now your first song review. Yeah. yeah. Because Ooh. last Ooh. last Ooh. week, uh, the Oat Gods intern made you switch topics. And, yeah. And now you have to review just a single song. Yep. What was your song this week? My song was Cars. It's not bad. Pedro, you gotta you got do more than that. No, no. What? What? At least say who sung it. Oh, okay, yeah, fine. Uh, it's by, uh, crap, crap. He's got the same last name as that actor. Uh, Gary Newman. Newman. Gary Newman, there we go. Uh, it's a song by this guy named Gary Newman. Jesus Christ. An English actor. Uh, actor, songwriter, songwriter. Oh, <laughs> God. Wow. Song, Paul Newman's not in English. 
Yeah, he no, is. no, not talking about Paul Newman. Who is not? Gary, Gary Newman. Gary Newman. No, that's who Paul, he's talking about. Paul Newman's not English. No, oh yeah, he's no, not. he's not. <laughs> Why are you talking about Paul Newman? Because he yeah. said English actor. I said actor, so, then I meant not actor songwriter. Because we're still talking about Gary Newman. Gary Newman, the right. author of this song. Paul uh, Newman wrote Cars. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, Paul Newman's last film was Cars. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. I see. Whoa. Look at all these all these ways that things could get mixed up in my head. Did Thomas Newman score Cars? The movie? <laughs> Ooh, good question. I don't know. I don't know. Shit. Someone anyway, Gary Newman, Cars, off of the album The Pleasure Principle, came out in 1979. Uh, was number one in the UK for a while. Number one oh. in Canada. Number nine U.S. Billboard Top 100. Um, fairly well liked song all around. It seems like. Um, it's this like. It seems like. Actually, I, I actually did like this song. Um, it got a little repetitive after a while because not very many lyrics, and I listened to it like a thousand times on repeat. So that just tends to happen. But no, um, not bad. <laughs> very catchy, uh, fun little tune. Apparently, um, Greg Newman got the inspiration by this uh, for this song. Who the hell's from- Greg Newman? Greg Gary Newman, whatever. I'm, I'm He's trying. really good at this. You it's, guys. It's, it's my first time. Come on, again. Um, he be was topic. inspired by this song. Inspired to make this song by um, a fit of road rage that happened, according to Wikipedia. Huh. Yeah, uh, this is this is the quote from Wikipedia again. In case you didn't hear. Uh, I was in traffic in London once and had a problem with some people in front. They tried to beat me up and get me out of the car. I locked the doors and eventually drove up on the pavement and got away from them. It's kind of to do with that. It explains how you feel safe inside a car in the modern world. When you're in it, your whole mentality is different. It's like your own little personal empire with four wheels on it. So then he wrote this song, and that is why he feels safe in his car. Uh... (laughs) The music video. Oh man! I feel like you that see- was. I feel like that explanation made me like the song a lot. Less. I know, right? I, I I started getting bored of it just because I listened to it so many times. You and know what? Though, if you're writing a song, how many times are you going to come up with a great explanation for why you wrote the song? It's like it right. sounds good. I wrote. I wrote it. I, I would to make love money. to hear Paul Simon's explanations for <laughs> any of the songs on Hearts and Bones. <laughs> well, he had you know for two of them. Okay, but cars are cars. I'd love to hear his explanation for that. Maybe he heard this song and he's like, oh, Oh, I can make a song about cars, too. That guy did not clarify what cars are. (laughs) I need to clear this up. Uh, um, Where was I? Yeah, so that explanation did make the song a little more interesting. And yeah, the music video is, it's kind of cool. It's way out there. Um, It's just him singing with the weirdest freeze frames ever um not even that weird it's just him singing to a mic and then it cuts to a bunch of different instruments and like there's a shot of him playing a tambourine inside the tambourine that he's playing (laughs) which was kind of crazy and then cut and it just just some random face of his would freeze in the frame one time when you're expecting it to freeze because it always does it on like a down drum beat or something you're expecting it to freeze and see his face it just cuts to this drummer looking at you kind of creepy <laughs> it was so special my um, favorite freeze frame was when gary he freezes and he tilts his head to the left and then his entire head pops up on the right side of the frame <laughs> at the exact same time. Oh, weird. it was so strange and it made me laugh a lot every freeze frame was so Bizarrely chosen. Yeah. What's the year on this song? I know we uh, did it in 79. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you guys catch the end where like it's sort of panning out and you see a bunch of instruments playing, but also you see a bunch of him like holding steering wheels? But it's yeah. not like he's driving. They're each holding the steering wheel at a fixed angle. <laughs> like, not moving their so, hands. I caught on to this about a minute into the music video. And I just kind of imagined Gary Newman talking to his producer saying... All right, um, excited to record this. What's our car budget for the music video? And he goes, "Oh, we do, we do not have one. <laughs> there is not a single car in the music video nope. called Cars. Nope. <laughs> it is just them in a weird Star Trek chamber, uh, playing things and freezing. 
yep. and looking very, very serious about this topic. Exactly. It's very well, important. He's trying to, he's not telling you that cars are cars, he's telling you what it's like to be in a car. It's so true. you don't necessarily it's need a, to just see. Just through music. A car. It's exactly. not a visual medium. This exactly. is a it's not very comfortable. It looks very exactly. safe. Mm. Did it? Mm, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think the music video was a lot of fun. I kind of want to watch it again just because it, it gets it's better. Goofy. Every time. It's such a catchy tune. It's, it is. It's a very simple, like... I've had it stuck in my head for, like, basically the past week. I mm-hmm. When I listened to it for the show, I I don't remember where I heard it the first time, but I just I heard it this time and thought, oh, I've heard this my entire life. I don't know huh. why. I think it... it it was so catchy, it went through both directions of time. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense to me. Yeah. I get that. Um, but yeah, all in all, not not bad of a song. Although I'm still pissed off about having to do songs. But not not the worst one to start out with. Technically, weren't you doing songs before, and this yeah. is just a different song? Or I was doing pieces. Different, different. This now okay. has okay. actual titles. Pieces by composers, not songs by some guy who's playing off of an actor. I don't think he's playing off of an actor. It's no. that his last name. That's even sort of correct. Oh. No, I just pronounced him. I guess they're not. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, not bad. Uh, How many inches do you give it? I feel confident giving this a. Ooh, this is this is an interesting choice. Um, oh man, because it's so stuck in my head, it keeps trying to bring the grade up, but I, it's not that. It's not that high. Uh, Three point, three point, three point eight. All right, Lee. I'm gonna give it a four. I love this song. It's just so fun and catchy. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna give it a three point five. It's it's catchy. It's likable, but it's also super dumb. <laughs> it's really it dumb. Is. But it, that's why it's fun because it is dumb. Three point five is still a positive rating. It's just oh, like yeah. Yeah. you can't actually say it's critically any good. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually exactly where I fall as well. Three point five. Um, I'm a little biased, I think, because uh, in the 70s, I would go clubbing sometimes, and this mm. was just everywhere. This was the club song of the 70s? <laughs> yeah. So it's, and what, the very last year of the 70s? Yeah. came out in 79. Yeah, yeah so, for, so for a few months, this was the, the clubbing song, song of mm-hmm. the 70s, of the entire decade. Don't yeah. judge him on accuracy, he was clubbing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. You were um, in your car? You were safe in your car? Yeah. We're um, all very three. safe. Three. My rating is three. My rating. That's your biased rating? <laughs> it's still a good song. I'm just right. like, I would probably give it higher if it was like my first time hearing it. Okay, fair. Um, before we move on to the children's book, I realized we skipped over the hinge fact. Oh, right. Oh. Uh, the, wow. uh, when, when, when Stonehenge was first being written about, uh, which is like a really long time ago, like 1200 or before, it, it's written as Stanhenge, which is a <laughs> dumb fact, but I really want it to be a Stonehenge made of people named Stan. Twelve hundred AD. Well, the, the one of the one of the references to Stanhenge is from a, is from a manuscript from twelve hundred eighty. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that actually writes about it in English, you know, like English English. So yeah, gotcha. Stanhenge. Henge of Stans. That was a great uh, Henge fact. We're going to have those uh, for the next 990 episodes. We're so. totally going to have enough, guys. <laughs> Wait, only 990? 91. We're trucking along. 991. 91. Oh. Just, just kidding. You have way more to go. Oh, man. I'll <laughs> also, never make it. Also, you started this in episode two. You should go back and do one first. Part. Sure. Uh, now let's move on to this obscure French children's book, which is going to just boost up our ratings of this podcast like crazy. Adam. Yeah. Let's talk about 100 million francs. Let's do it. <laughs> um, it was written by Paul Berna, or if you don't know that name, uh, try this on for size. Jean-Marie Edmond Sabron. Oh, I know that guy. Yeah. Hey. There you go. We partied together. He's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Paul Berna was his pseudonym. As you know, Pedro. Mm-hmm. Um, so 100 million francs. Yeah, because Pedro knows names. Of course. <laughs> He's so good at names, guys. <laughs> so good. Stop eating. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've been chowing down on these curly fries the whole time. Yeah, but not while talking on mic. True, true, true. All right, um, this book. This is an interesting book. Um, it's about a gang of 12-year-olds or less, like between 6 and 12-year-olds, mm-hmm. 
and they have this um, this really interesting set piece. It's a, a horse without a head, but it's like on tricycle wheels. And it's a tricycle shaped like a horse. But without the, a head. But the aesthetics of it has kind of broken down because they keep using it in a very, like, wonderfully childlike, dangerous way. Yeah, they they ride it down a hill as fast as they can. Um, and it goes around a bend, and then at the very end, there's, like, a ramp that they can fall into or they break. Some of them break. But the leader of the gang is known for, like, never breaking. Now, wait, so I, I want to get this picture right because I think my mind is keep my mind is confused. The head is missing, but the tricycle has the horse body. Yes, so it's okay. a, it's a headless horse. I'm I'm imagining you know a tricycle with a horse head on it. That that's normal. Someone riding something like that, but no, no. okay. Head head is gone. Other way around, yeah. Just that's, because that's of weird. constant is it still use. The tail? Is the tail part of the description? I can't remember. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. I think it's in the illustrations. Yeah, but I could imagine that would be pretty quick to we go to. <laughs> Um, so the story is actually about these. Uh, this gang uh, is confronted by these two big burly guys in like lumberjack jackets trying to uh, take their horse for, from them, and that's the inciting incident. They soon figure out why these people need the horse, and so badly, even though it's like they say multiple times it's not worth anything, but the two men offer them, I think, ten thousand francs for it. Something ridiculous. Yeah, something something insane. That's um, not that much. How many francs are in a dollar? Uh, before they got rid of it, it was roughly seven. So I guess that is still a lot. Yeah. yeah this is the seventies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was no. Well. 50, oh wow. It was published in fifty five. Oh, fifty five. So you yeah. can earn that. That's a ton of money. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um. So yeah, it's a lot, and then. I don't know. It's. I feel like if you say much more, it kind of ruins the mystery of the book. This is an out-of-print book. Oh, great. Cool. Oh. So we can just say it. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I think we can say the, the next thing. Yeah. Um, they, well, what would the next thing be? It's kind of... <laughs> the horse is stolen. Yeah, they, the, yeah, the horse is stolen. But you don't know by who. No. But uh, it's obvious. Oh, so it's one of the kids. No. Okay. No, the kids the kids are all like in an inseparable gang and it's like they don't admit anyone over twelve because they just their reasoning is that twelve year olds and older get are just silly, they say. <laughs> Although the leader's gonna like, probably change that rule when I turn thirteen actually. Yeah. <laughs> well no, he's he's on the cusp of twelve. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. Um, so So this book it had a very kind of Home Alone vibe had kind of a, a very strong little rascals vibe. Mm-hmm. Home Alone came out after this, but like mm-hmm. the kind of thing of like a bunch of goonies, this kind of thing of, of kids up against adult forces, uh, a lot of physical comedy, lots of shenanigans. And yet, I didn't like this book. Yeah, it was so, and I was worried as the translation thing, but it wasn't. Like when. It begins with them doing the the horse down the rails and whatnot. It's like, okay, here we go. This is a good way to introduce the game. Mm -hmm. There's no way this can be the entire plot of the next, like, 200 pages of this book. It was. It is. It's all about this tricycle. Um, And although it does go to some interesting things, I never found any of the set pieces of hilarity to be worth all this trouble. It felt very weird and maybe too adult of me in the centuries years old of, like, I don't care about your toy anymore. <laughs> yeah. I think probably because I didn't care too much about the gang, because there's like 10 of them? Yeah, like there's, of them? there's I believe, 10. Um, and That's so many characters. It's so many mm-hmm. characters. They, was... they, they, they do, the author does mostly brush strokes for them. Um, you get to know, I think, three of them pretty well, but there's another one that he just keeps describing as the darkie. Because it's the only black <laughs> child, um, and it was 1955, so that's what they the Man, word those they use. French. Yeah, those French. Uh, <laughs> oh, fun fact: Pedro lived in France for a long time. I did. I don't care. I, I don't remember much of it anyway. <laughs> okay, good. He was drunk. Um, um, yeah. So yeah, they 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 glossed over a lot of the characters. Um, the main the main character who owned the horse, Ferdinand, was probably the most fleshed out because you meet his dad and his dad fixes horses and 
mm -hmm. about work. But also, then you have the the gang, then you have the police. There's a lot of characters in this thing. I really wished it was like a lot of uh, old English books where they had a table of uh, a list of characters in the front of the book. Yeah. Just like remember which, what are the ten names of the gang? Right. It, it was yeah. very difficult to follow, and the payoffs were never that strong. There was occasionally, I thought, a funny line or two, a funny moment. But this weirdly fell flat to me because this whole idea of like childhood gang doing shenanigans to get their toy back from gangsters, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a great premise. I'm, I'm all for that, but right, yeah, it's a good premise. It just doesn't. It kind of it kind of drags along because oh, the just you know a mystery. They keep finding things out, but they found out like it was just a really easy mystery to solve. I think because Which they is kind of in the thriller territory, but like yeah, they didn't get there fast enough. We all know right. who did it, right? And yeah, like, we know we know who the bad guys are. It happens basically after the heist, and so it's about them trying to find uh, the hundred million francs. Yeah, and it turns out I'm going to say the end here because it's just kind of dull. It, it turns was out super obvious. Yeah, it turns out someone tripped over the headless horse, shoved a key where the hundred million francs were into the horse, and then that's it. The kids like find the warehouse where the where the money is, and then the gangsters shoot at them. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, they end up getting bested by a group of dogs that the <laughs> that one of the gang members has kind of magical powers over. She can just whistle and... <laughs> and um, it's called training dogs. <laughs> yeah, she trains like hundreds of dogs, and they all listen for her whistle. whistle. And then they come and they beat up the gang. They, they chew at the gang, and then they're arrested, and then at the end they find the horse. I will say the one... The one redeeming part of it was at the very end, um, the leader of the gang, who's turning twelve, he rides the horse down the hill for the for the uh, like uh, for the first time since they've gotten it back, and he at, he he crashes and he's like he starts crying because he crashed and he's like I just turned twelve, it, this is it for me. There's I'm, I feel myself turning sillier and sillier, and then everyone in the gang is like, no, we can. We don't have to be a twelve-year-old gang, so that was kind of sweet. But it's hard to me tell. This is the first book of a series. Is it? Yeah, oh. on Goodreads, it had a couple more of this gang doing more shit. Oh, okay. I don't know how many translated to English, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know if they. I don't know if they really established most of the characters enough for me to really want no, to. No, I more. got. I lost track of almost all the characters because there's ten of them. Yeah, and like, that's a lot. Yeah. Especially when they like they, they just, you know, split up sometimes. This person talking like, okay, you're just a gang member, right? It was it was not that satisfying to me. I was really kind of looking forward to it. It seemed like a really fun premise, but I feel like the book kept kept saying like, this is fun without ever being fun, right? <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It sounds like it would be a fun like kids movie, a la. Home Alone and Little mm -hmm. Rascals. I think but... it could be like a good like Disney Channel kind of movie. And I think if you adapted a movie, your first thing would be is cut the characters in half. Yeah. Like, you get a gang of five, one policeman, you know, still two gang members and whatnot. Like, it's just felt very, very busy and mm -hmm. way too long. I mean, I'm, I'm not to claim about a hundred and what seventy page book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like, it, it did feel like for this story, this story is a hundred. 120 pages, maybe tops. The uh, the Disney Studios in Britain actually did film. This. Did they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. It's Where? called uh, the Horse Without a Head, the 100 million franc train robbery. It's a terrible title. Uh huh. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> it's a really terrible title. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Well, I'm gonna look for that. <laughs> yeah, should be our next film, regardless of what the guy. Absolutely. Well, the the French title of this is Le Cheval Sans Tête, which is oh, that's, the Horse yeah. Without a Head. Yeah. Right. Okay, so just, um, I mean, this is what it was listed in the official book. I'm grabbing the actual book that we read from. Oh. This was a Ping One copy. Um, this was a UK copy. And, uh, yeah, you want to read this? This cost us, like, two bucks on Amazon. True. This copy. Or email us, and we'll send it to you, because we don't or, want it anymore. <laughs> or <laughs> we'll make up a contest later on, and we'll send it to you that way. Great. I'm ready to hinge. Do it. It's just... Only us read the book. I feel like I have to get <laughs> your permission. All you. Yeah. Um, so I would say I would say two because there were some 
uh, there were some parts that kept me wanting to read, but overall, not so much. And I'm going to go with the two as well. It was the thing where, like, I was leaning more towards the three area, but as time kind of got passing, I think of the book, like, man, nothing stuck with me. It feels like the book ends, but then there's, t- like, two more chapters. Yeah. And Almost. so much lag in the middle. Yeah. Two hinges. Um, there we go. <laughs> that was an Ooh. obscure book re- review. Yeah. Another good one. And we didn't tell you to make I'm it this obscure. <laughs> we are so good at this, guys. <laughs> yep. Now we're going to wrap it up with a TV show that may be obscure to a lot of Americans, but this sucker ran for 12 seasons. Wow. Whoa. What? Oh, yeah. This is Danzel and Pasco. This is based off of a very popular book mystery series by Reginald Hill, and I'm actually almost done with the first book right now. And it's really good. And the show... It's also really good. It is um, it's a mystery series that ran in the UK for 12 years, from 1996 to 2007. Now, it is also in a very British vein. of It was about typically three to five episodes a season, each 90 minutes long. Uh, okay. So, like, it's it's a more reasonable 12-season show. Mm-hmm. There's only 40-something episodes in the whole series. I watched two seasons worth, the first two seasons, and I was going to jump ahead to see how it changed, but I kind of didn't want to because I really was enjoying the show. Mm-hmm. The The basic premise is, I swear it actually plays almost less cliche than I'm about to say, you have the the older detective, he's not that old, but he's this kind of old brute, he likes to drink a lot, he's this larger mm-hmm. man, he is less PC, and then you have Pasco, who's kind of just fresh out of the academy kind of thing, he's very kind of... He's very snobbish, more intellectual, and he kind of criticizes how Danzel does things, and the two of them together solve a mystery every episode. And it just plays off really well, partly because the show, in in the book, recognizes that dynamic, but doesn't overemphasize it. Mm -hmm. Like, really, like, both of them make an occasional quip at each other, but maybe only four or five in an episode like it's really not that like exaggeratedly annoying Mm -hmm. they really are professionals um but it was very fun and it was very it was very good procedural I thought whenever I introduced a new character because my biggest worry about procedurals is that you have ten new characters and they're all going to be underdeveloped but I really kind of liked how everything played out I thought everywhere they went the world felt real even when it was an episode when I thought it was a preposterous world, mm-hmm. like um, a flower competition. People, that still was played with a bit that of. That seems like a real thing to me. Oh, it's definitely a real thing. It's just a dumb episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the Stewart episode, from season two. Uh, it's called Deadheads, and but it just did a good job. It kind of recognized the strengths of the characters, and it did have a very kind of naturalistic narrative going on between the episodes. Pascal is dating someone, and she is almost more Pasco than he is, because she's very dismissive of kind of the old way the UK cops are behaving, especially Danzel. And it sounds very familiar. I mean, it is. It, it, it's, it just seems like cliche, that cliche. But when you mm-hmm. watch it; it just it's very fresh. It's very well made. It is. Kind of be a nice treat if I was watching it back when this aired. Like, oh, I'll be happy to watch these guys for a couple hours mm-hmm. this year, and then they'll be back next year. When the, did it come out? Ninety six, two thousand seven. Oh wow! Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So I'm pretty free. So, yeah. and it's it's very well made, and all the episodes I watched, which was two seasons worth, <laughs> were all based off books from Reginald Hill that adapt an entire book into mm-hmm. an episode, and. Oh. Later on, they ran out books, so they did their own. So I don't know how good they were, but they did it for like five seasons. So I imagine it was yeah. light at least. Um, I'm and I'm very excited to continue to watch this show between all the other shows. I'm going to watch this podcast because, mm-hmm. like, already the two seasons, they really let the actors kind of add more nuance to the characters. There is an episode when it's actually Pascal's not even in it. It's just Denzel, who's just in a place he didn't want to be at. He's in a very like annoying like bed and breakfast kind of place that's out of his comfort zone. 
and then there is you know a crime happening there, of and course. he almost annoyingly has to solve the crime. You know, you kind of hate all the people there. Isn't that, I feel like, always how it goes whenever a procedural detective goes on vacation? Oh, there's, sure. They're like, there's always a crime. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't be following them as the audience with them on vacation. Yeah, that would be a really I boring idea. I mean, <laughs> Sometimes I just still, want to see just the like, hero. I like to think laps. about it from their perspective of, like, everywhere they go. Well, I will give them that he was on vacation at least because... Spoiler, because you guys are going to watch the show. Um, I actually do want to watch the show, because I saw, like, the first maybe ten minutes of the first episode, and I fell in love with it from the beginning. I love the music. I love that trumpet. You fell in love with it, but you stopped for ten minutes? Well, because it was, like, three hours ago. Okay. So right before you came over here to start recording. Yeah, basically. That makes Um, sense. Great. I think you'll, like, the first episode is uh, basically the first novel, which is A Clubbable Woman. And it's it's good, and it's it's very fun to read the book because the book was not intended to be a series, so mm-hmm. it definitely has those perspectives. But much like the show, and much like every episode, they are absolutely the main characters, but they really let the side characters get breathing room. They really kind of could be the main character of the episode. They use the ninety minutes well, and unlike Arne Dahl, which we reviewed, I believe, in episode five around there which was based off a, a Swedish book series and turned into a Swedish crime show, that 90 minutes felt very dense and very kind of sometimes unemotional. This mm-hmm. one really allowed a lot more, I keep saying breathing room, because it, just, it feels that way. It's very nice, but also it's still very adult. Mm-hmm. Um, they're dealing with murder, and there are, are sex cases, and... It's, it's a good show. I, I was very happily surprised by this. I don't know if I'm going to finish the entire series, but this is a very uh, nice thing to have on. This I give this a very solid um, I don't know, 4.3. I like the show. All right. I give my 10 minutes a 4. That is irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> very much Because so. I'm pretty sure neither of the directors even showed up those 10 minutes. Probably <laughs> not. But, no, I just loved it because, like, what? They open it. I thought it was the opening credits, but it was just people playing rugby mm-hmm. with trumpet in the <laughs> background, and I got—I just felt happy and warm inside, and I knew everything was going to be all right, and I was going to make this show. Wait, wait, you're wrong because someone gets Am murdered. Am I wrong? Well, someone gets murdered. Do they? It's a I'll, murder I'll mystery. Look away on screen. I was, I was printing some stuff off. No, you said something was going to be all right, and. It's not. They have to oh, oh, well, yeah, but no, I'll write myself, as in my relationship with the show. Oh, okay. Well, I recommend you finish the episode and let me know what you think. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go back through. Can you jump around in it, or should you splash you know, it You know, I harder? imagine you can, because the, the narrative I talked about really was, it was slight, it was mostly about the relationship between Pasco and his girlfriend, mm-hmm. and that did evolve throughout the seven episodes I watched. Okay. But I... It's primarily, like, every episode's like 90% the case. But I'm neurotic. I used to watch the evolution. So I want to see the acting change. Absolutely. Between it all. And. Is that? Oh, I bet he's going to switch what you're doing again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Congratulations, thanks. everyone, on making it to your 10th episode. Congratulations <laughs> on being alive. You should have gotten fired. Shut up. Okay, wait. I hate you. See, look at what you made Austin do. Look at that. <laughs> there was a little fanfare. I had Austin play for your 10th episode because we're all so proud of you. I didn't have control of my hands. Upstairs. How'd that feel, Austin? Like, you just, like, had to press buttons? I felt violating. Yeah, we have one. Yeah, see? He violates you. We actually <laughs> we don't have trust an, him. We have another new intern, and uh, we're just letting him do hands. Like, he's not ready to possess a whole body yet. So he's just, just, doing, hands to just do. doing hands. Yeah, That's it's a little creepy. easier. Like, mm. but it's not creepy. You guys are disgusting already. There's nothing. <laughs> Hi, Pedro. Hi. How'd you like your new category today? Meh. You were very good. <laughs> oh, that really? was creepy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Anyway, how's it going with everyone? I mean, well, we're here. It's fine, intern. Just... Yeah, great. Yeah, All right, you're making a lot of headway. Ten. Ten, yeah. Ten whole episodes. Yeah. One percent, kind of. We're, yeah. Yep. 
That's great. We're all really pulling for you up there. Yeah, well, yeah. Bullshit. I'm sure you are. All right, you ready for your next number? I think we are. It's 326. Hurrah. 326? <laughs> yeah, episode 11, uh, 326. Later. I suppose I have another song to do. 326. Let's see. Ooh, exciting. Mm. I have Grievous Angel by Graham Parsons. I, ooh, I have Gruyere cheese. Ooh. Oh, that's cool. So tasty. It's probably better than mine. Mine's a famous blue raincoat. Like, the song is called Famous Blue Raincoat. By who? Leonard uh, Cohen. Leonard, yeah, oh, Leonard Cohen. I, I don't know who that is. Oh, the movie, we're going to go, um, we haven't had some in a while. This is Ashes and Diamonds. What's so, the number? I didn't hear the number. 326? Oh, hold on. Yeah, I just need to look up in line as well. Uh, it know. is uh, Spider-Man A uh, Nancy by James Berry. I bet oh. that's not the Spider-Man I want it to be. Is that Spider-Man, James Berry, like the James Spider-Man. Berry? Spider-Man. No, like Chuck Spider-Man. Berry. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh, he was heavily upset with that Martin could fly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the TV shows, holy shit. Uh oh. Yes. What's going on? What is it? After all the bullshit I've had to watch. <laughs> bullshit. You like like half of those. Don't care. We're watching <laughs> Cheers next week, Kai. Yay! Yeah. Woo. Cheers. Everybody knows your name. That's right. Cheers. That'll be nice. <laughs> you guys all know when they were. <laughs> yeah, pretty much just that one. Yeah. Our, that thing's very exciting. And now, you know, it has been discussed that. This is episode 10, Peter did his first song, and we have Iron Titan mythology that we are only going to die after we finish our tasks. Oh. So Pedro actually has nine more songs to listen to, which is basically an album. This is the least burdenous thing you can ever do, really. Um, but we are going to stick by him. We are going to review it along with him. Thank so you. for the next couple of weeks, we typically have our episodes come out on Thursdays. Every Monday from now on, we're going to have a small bonus episode, which will be a review of two or three of the songs to catch up with Pedro. So, Pedro, why don't you read off the nine songs that we're going to be reviewing over the next couple weeks? Yay! Let's see here. Okay, what do we got? We got The Look of Love by Dusty Springfield. That's actually a great song. I love that song. And it's written by Burke Bacharach. Anyway. Save it for the episode. episode. Okay. Um... You don't know me. You with a spelled with a U, not Y O U. Uh, by Armand von Helden. I am the resurrection by the Stone Roses. No more tears. Ooh, by Ozzy Osbourne. That'll be fun. Uh, Kelly Watch by nope. Kelly Watch the Stars. There we go. Kelly yes. Watch the Stars by Air. What else we got? Sweetness by Yes. Ooh, more okay. Yes. Short, short and sweet. Hey, that's why it rang a bell. Uh, Allons à Lafayette by Joe and Cloroma Falcon. That's a great name. Um, hmm. It's Like That by Run DMC. Yeah. And Tomorrow Never Knows by The Beatles. So, interesting, interesting list we got. Maybe, maybe Intern's not a terrible person. God. Yeah, I know, he kind of is. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, know, I still don't like him. But, yep, so you guys have that to look forward to. Please listen and tell us what you think. Yes, and you can do that by emailing us at theimmortalspodcast at gmail.com. We read every email that comes in. We love to hear your thoughts and everything that we've reviewed so far. Also, if you want to write a whole email, you can tweet at us at theimmortalspod on Twitter. We'll also be posting there links and different pictures to things we discuss. And that's also a lot of fun. And starting next week, we are going to entice you to write more iTunes reviews. Everyone who reviews us on iTunes, we don't care the star rating. Prefer it's positive, but we do not care. Pedro's going to give that username Wait, a 15 second sincere compliment. Wait, I'm going to do what? Pedro is going to look into his heart, into his soul, into his bones, and give a sincere compliment blindly based entirely on your username. Oh, on the username. Okay. Yeah, which is what they get the review on. Well, I mean, what if what if they review us terribly? You're still going to give them a compliment because that is what we promised. So I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna look at the username first. Hey, if you have a good username, come by, give us a review. For sure. Nope, it does not matter what kind of username you have. Nope. Leave us a review. It helps people find oh. us on on iTunes and people can find our show, and that can you know be nice as we trek along for the next 991 episodes. Yeah. So what's uh, the us- what's uh, the username? 
No, next week. No, yeah, oh, next, next week. I, oh, jeez. All right. No, can't just drop show. something like this on me. <laughs> <laughs> Even the host. <laughs> Sorry, so, yeah. once again, thank you all for listening so much. It means so much to us to have these Indeed. kind of listenership and downloads. Ten episodes in. You all are wonderful. We'll catch you Thursday next as we review all the things we said for number 326. My name is Austin. I'm Curly Fries. I'm Sarah. <laughs> I'm Lee. And I'm Ostrich Mead. And we'll catch you next week. Cars Thanks for are Bye. Cars all over the world. Cars are cars all over the world. Similarly made, similarly sold, in a motorcade, abandoned when they're old. Cars are cars all over the world.
found control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Seven. Sing countdown engines on Three, two, check ignition and may God's love be with you. Thank you. 